Father God, we thank you for all things. Thank you for life and health and strength, for mercy and grace, love, compassion, all the things that you show towards your children, even though we're undeserving. And right now, at this special moment where I have an opportunity, Lord, to represent you, there would be only one problem that I would run into up here, and that would be self-rising up. So I'm asking that you would please keep self in check. As we discuss this vital message today, I'm praying for your Holy Spirit to lead. And I pray that each person that came for a special blessing will receive just that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Satan will go to the extent of his power to harass, tempt, and mislead God's people. He who dared to face and tempt and taunt our Lord, and who had power to take him in his arms and carry him to a pinnacle to the temple, now that takes nerve. He's picking up the Son of God. So what do you think, he, how do you think he respects us? Not too much, amen? If they yield, if we yield, now let me start back here. I saw evil angels contending for souls and angels of God resisting them. The conflict was severe. Evil angels were crowding about them, corrupting the atmosphere with their poisonous influence and stupefying their sensibilities. That means that they're putting us in a daze. We don't know what hit us because we're so attracted to what the world has to offer. Holy angels were anxiously watching these souls and we're waiting to drive back Satan's host. But it is not the work of good angels to control minds against the will of the individuals. If they yield to the enemy and make no effort to resist him, let that sink in. If we make no effort to resist him, do you think he's gonna stop and go away like that dog, the big dog did to the little dog? No, because when the devil gets you down, he's gonna kick you, he's gonna stomp you, he's gonna to try to destroy you. Then angels of God, can do but a little more than hold and check the host of Satan, that they should not destroy until further light be given to those in peril, to move them to arouse and look to heaven for help. Jesus will not commission holy angels. Now get this. Jesus will not commission holy angels to extricate those who make no effort to help themselves. 
Now, we understand God has all power, but us without God cannot, and God without us will not. That was on page 57. I'm on page 56 now. <clears throat> she says, I have been shown that we must be guarded on every side. How many sides? On every side. And perseveringly resist the insinuations of devices of Satan. He has transformed himself into an angel of light and is deceiving and leading thousands captive. <clears throat> my, my voice may be challenged because of the fans, but hear me. Just pray for me, okay? Matter of fact, okay. It says, and the advantages he takes of the science of the human mind is tremendous. Here, serpent-like, he imperceptibly creeps in to corrupt the work of God. The miracles and works of Christ he makes all human. If Satan should make an open, bold attack upon Christianity, it would bring the Christian in distress and agony at the feet of his Redeemer. And the strong and mighty deliverer would affright the bold adversary away. But Satan transformed into an angel of light, works upon the mind <clears throat> to allure from the only safe and right path. The sciences of phrenology, psychology, and mesmerism have been the channel through which Satan has come more directly to this generation. So these three things, phrenology, maybe some of you have heard of it, psychology, and mesmerism. <clears throat> I'm going to step to this mic over here. get out from that fan. Phrenology, a system now rejected by which an analysis of character and of the development of the faculties can allegedly be made by studying the shape and protuberances of the skull. So the devil is into the science of the mind. He's not into, you know, surface stuff. He goes deep. Then there's psychology, a science dealing with the mind and with mental <clears throat> and emotional processes the science, and I'm saying science because that's technical, the science of human and animal behavior, the sum of the actions, traits, attitudes, thoughts, mental states, etc. So he deals with all that. He deals with our, he, he can read our expressions. It's as if he can read our mind. Though he can't, he's been around so long that he can read you. He doesn't read your mind, but he can read you, your actions, your behaviors, amen? And then there's mesmerism. Mesmerism is hypnotism. So practical by mesmer, so practiced by mesmer in connection with his theory on animal magnetism. Hypnotic or irresistible attraction, fascination. So that means that while we're sitting in front of the TV and we think we're watching it, it's taking us apart, it's dissecting us with all of our electrical devices, our iPods and our cell phones and our, you name it, whatever we have, do we have it or does it have us? We have to understand that men, women, doesn't matter. If we have a, pro a problem with pornography, then we don't need to be sitting at a computer at one in the morning because that's a problem. And I remember one time I, I wrote a poem for the students out at Pine Forge because we were doing something on, on sexual addiction. And even though I'm not gonna say, I know there are kids in here and I'm not gonna say anything that's inappropriate. <clears throat> but the poem that I wrote, I wanna share with you, is entitled Testing One, Two, Three. Here's a take from the council of the powers to be. Standing room only, for one to see. Angels from the good side, the bad side too. You might wanna listen, because they're talking about you. Jesus stood up and called the meeting to order. He put the devil up first because his time was shorter. So the devil was to speak on where he'd been. If he had a favorite subject, then it had to be sent. So he steps to the stage and he heads for the mic. Said, I want to tell a story about some folk I like. There's so many now, so where do I begin? I guess I'll just talk about boys to men. He takes the mic. Is this thing on? He took a deep breath and the devil was gone. Now he prided himself being dirty and mean, how he can mess you up, never even be seen, tried to take out Christ at a very young age, missing out on that, only filled him with rage. Now the boy has power, he ain't just making noise, he went back to the lab and invented some toys. He'll introduce to the homies some glitter and ice. They'll be living so large they can't see Christ, the cares of the world, the rims, the whips, and he'll put a special spell on juicy lips. 
phones and minis and see-through glasses. That's what boys like in hang low trousers. iPods, cell phones, computers were next. The devil said, yeah, and he started to text. I'll send a sex message, that's what I'll do. I'm sitting here hot, and I'm waiting for you. Got the hots for you, wanna see what I mean? Turn on the computer and step through the screen. Now, boys will be boys, as the saying goes. It don't take much to put a hook in their nose. Just feed their ego and show them some skin, and the downward spiral is about to begin. Mm. It used to be grades in geography. Now they sold out on pornography. The boy had an itch, need a little scratching. In the wrong room now, and the door is latching. Too many toys, never listen to mother. Is this mic on? I'm talking to you, brother. Testing, testing, one, two, three. If you ain't listening, that's who you'll be. Drinking, smoking, strung out and crack. So far out, you'll never make it back. So if you have any sense, you'll heed my talk. Think about the journey before you walk. If you must have toys, don't make it sex. This stuff is, is, is a killer, and you might be next. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Let's think about sex. Let's think about the phrenology of the mind. We don't understand how deep Satan gets. We think that he's playing games. He's not playing games. He's playing for keeps. And when he gets you down, if it wasn't for the good graces of God Almighty, most of us would not be here. I do not deserve to be standing here right now. Young people, be very careful. The enemy is after you. He's after young and old alike. In our scripture, we read in Matthew chapter 16, I'm trying to hurry along. I want to just go there real quick. Just to highlight a couple of things before we move on. Matthew chapter 16, we're looking at verse 21. And it said, when you heard the scripture read, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer. Do what? Suffer. suffer many things. And it said from that time forth, because he had been talking like this previously. The first couple of years he wasn't telling them about how he was going to have to be sacrificed. And now he's starting to, at every opportunity that he has, he's letting them know that I'm going to die at the hands of men. And he told them, he didn't tell them in sign language, in, in Morse code, he told them in plain, whatever language they spoke, but they weren't hearing him. Too often, the Lord is trying to tell us things, and the reason that we're not hearing it is because we don't want to. Because we have our own agenda. We write out our agenda at the beginning of the day, and we don't want God to sign it and endorse it. But God, he puts his name at the top, he leaves a blank page, and he wants us to sign it, because that's living by faith, amen? amen. Then Peter, but then it says, from that time forth, Jesus to show unto his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, you remember the story, get thee behind me, Satan, when actually Christ was talking to Satan, not to Peter. And that's funny how, right now, Peter didn't get it. Whereas, if you back up a few verses, he was declaring who Jesus was because Jesus was asking his disciples, who do you say I am? The Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he spoke correctly. Now he's doing the devil's talking. Sometimes we are, can be some of our Christian friends' worst discouragers. Are you listening to me? Sometimes, if we're not prayed up, then we're going to be operating on flesh. And when you operate on flesh, there's going to be a problem. But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then, said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and do what? Follow me. Now, if you follow Jesus, you're going where the action is. Jesus isn't running from action. He's running, matter of fact, he is the action. But he was letting his disciples know that when his mission was completed, he was going to be sacrificed 
he was going to be killed, they were trying to hear it. Why? Because they were looking for another kingdom. And too often, that's what we're looking for. We want to use his name, but the Bible says that we have a form of godliness, but we're denying the power thereof. Amen? So it said, for, for whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is it a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and then lose his own soul? There's nothing down here worth me losing my soul. And then when it goes over to Luke 9, 23, you don't have to turn there, but it kind of mimics what we just read. It says, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And he added this word daily. That means the only way you're going to stay on this walk is to pay attention to this walk on a daily basis. This is not a once in a week, once in a month, once a year thing. Because the devil is constantly trying to wipe us out. Every moment, which is quicker than a second, he is on any opportunity that he can find to wipe us out, to discourage us, to separate us from the Father of life. Amen? In 1 Peter 2, 21-24, you don't have to read it, I got it right here. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow his steps. So if he suffers, do you think we shouldn't suffer? If he suffered, do you think we're not going to suffer? Think about that. Who did no sin, neither was God find in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. I'll stop right there. When people do things to us, do we want to take matters into our own hands? Or do we do like the Bible says, and we wait and let God be the avenger? You don't have to answer me, because I think you know the answer to that question. <laughs> Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. This thing about surrender is deep. It's not attractive because we don't like pain. I know I don't. But I'll tell you what. Heaven will be cheap enough, no matter what we go through down here. And I have to add this too. No cross, no crown. No holiness, no heaven. And this is the perfect arena right here where we suffer trials and tribulations to prepare us to move into the kingdom. Because God is trying to convince us to lose self and he will help us through the process. What gets the mind gets us. And what gets us is reported in our thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions. You see, you can't do anything that you didn't already think about doing. Because I contend that you don't act out before you act in. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he in his heart. And so we have to understand this mind-body connection. And we have to understand that when we think that we can get away with things and people can't, they don't know what we're thinking. No, they don't know what we're thinking. But just watch somebody long enough, and you'll know how they think. Just watch them out long enough, and you'll be able to compare the walk with the talk. And it's either going to match, or it's not going to match. Murmuring gets providence when we are forced to walk the path of obedience. And that word force, that's a heavy word for us. When we are forced to walk the path of obedience in an unplanned pace, or an unplanned pace. Did I say that right? Unplanned place, we don't like to be where we don't think we need to be, or an unplanned pace, we don't want to go too slow. Don't you hate it when you get when you're zipping along in your car and you just want to get to work or to wherever you're going and this slow turtle gets in front of you and slows your roll. And it's only a one lane highway and all you can do is take it. That's an unplanned pace. But you know something? When you get up in the morning and you pray for patience, things like that are supposed to happen. And when it does happen, we seem to be the first ones that are surprised that God is answering our prayers because that's how he answers it. What a paradox. 
So, case in point, an account of what people at large were thinking on the occasion of the Beatitudes is as follows. Because when the Beatitudes were given, I went to the thoughts on the Mount of the Blessings. And um, I knew that the disciples were thinking that Jesus was going to raise up the kingdom and all that. But it says here that the multitude had future hopes. The everybody out there had the wrong idea of the mission that Jesus Christ had. Let me share this with you. With a feeling that something more than usual might be expected, the disciples had pressed about their master. From the events of the morning, they gathered assurance that some announcement was about to be made in regard to the kingdom, which as they fondly hoped, he was soon about to establish. A feeling of expectancy pervaded the multitude. Now the multitude is not the 12. The multitude is everybody. And eager faces gave evidence of the deep interest. As they sat upon the green hillside awaiting the words of the divine teacher, their hearts were filled with thoughts of future glory. Now they weren't expecting what Jesus was getting ready to say. They were just thinking what they wanted to think. So it says there were scribes and Pharisees who looked forward to the day when they should have dominion over the hated Romans and possess the riches and join the ranks of Dollar Bill Gates and Warren Buffet's mortgage board of cash. The poor peasants and fishermen hoped to hear the assurance that their wretched Motel 8s, the scanty food, the life of toil, and fear of want were to be exchanged for Ritz Carlton's of plenty in days of ease. In place of the one coarse garment, which was their covering by day and their blanket by night, they hoped that Christ would give them the Gucci threads and costly Armani robes of their conquerors. So they had bright hopes. They weren't thinking about spiritual. They weren't thinking about salvation. They were thinking about, what can I get? Oh boy, we're going we're gonna to put them to flight now. All hearts thrilled with the proud hope that Israel was soon to be honored by the nations as the chosen of the Lord and Jerusalem exalted as the head of a universal kingdom. Boy, did they ever have the wrong idea. That's not the way Jesus rolls. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, Jesus, you're kidding, right? Come on, let's run them out. Give us liberty or give us death, but the poor in spirit save your breath. They blamed us, shamed us with multiplied spice. We're second-class citizens without many rights. What gets the mind gets us, and what gets us is reported in our thoughts, actions, words, and behavior. They weren't ready. They were not willing to sacrifice. All they wanted to do was get, get, get. And sometimes we're the same exact way. I have a newsflash for you. When God calls a man, he calls a man to die, and especially to his rights. When God calls a man, he calls a man to die, and especially die to his rights. Don't, don't you hate it when you get to an intersection? I hate to keep using the road analogy. You get to four-way stop sign, and you know that you have the right of way, but somebody bogarts. The only right that we have are the rights that someone else affords us if they respect those rights. But if they don't respect those rights, then don't get all upset oh, because that's the time it. today. See, if we, get, if we get prayed up and stay prayed up, then we won't be wrapped around the finger of the devil all day long. Now let's look at self in a demanding spirit. The author writer Larry Crabb wrote, unrelenting pain is the most suitable environment in which to grow a demanding spirit. One of the terrible things about a demanding spirit is that it feels so good. A disease without symptoms is bad enough, but a disease that increases our feeling of well-being while it slowly destroys our health is worse. When things aren't happening the way they ought to be, when I'm not being treated the way I think I should, it feels good to rise up against that. Demandingness is such a serious problem because it rarely feels like a problem. You may actually feel stronger and more alive when we pursue our demands and rehearse to ourselves their credibility because we're so right. For too many of us, our identity, our sense of well-being, our sense of life's experience is wrapped up in things that aren't going our way. And without knowing it, we have pledged ourselves to misery until things change 
but they may never change. You know anybody like that? It's like, if things don't get better, I'm not going to cooperate. Well, they may never be cooperating because when God tries to teach us a lesson, we're not going to skip to the next class. We're going to have to graduate. And the way that we graduate is we have to go through the course. And no matter how long it takes, if we have to go back to ground one, that's what God will have us do in his mercy.